Sean is a 25 year old female, healthy professional, young professional that was um, apparently there was a SantaCon in Nash Vegas this year, beginning, you know, is in uh, early December and um, sustained an injury, um, probably, you know, doing something that they thought they could do with uh, a little bit less alcohol and sustained an injury uh, to an ankle. Uh, Daddy, I need a one. And we're always here for you. Hold on one second. Let me. Uh, let's see. Hey, Matt, can you mute? And all the options have you up in the air. Matt, <laughs> calendar. <laughs> all right, I think we're good. Um, so these are the X-rays. Um, uh, you know, it's my AP and mortis and my lateral. Jan, what do you think? This comes into the ER. These are the injury films. Um, what do you think of think of these X-rays? Yeah. So the first thing is, um, I, I don't think I can grab hold of your screen, but if you can point out how the talus is laterally translated, so that means the talus is more, you know, under the fibula as opposed to the tibia. For everybody on the call, I don't. Can you can you put on your laser pointer? Um, yeah. Let's see here. What do you Indeed. or at least your mouse um because these are key things to kind of realize what we're looking for both preoperatively and intraoperatively uh, when we're assessing our reduction and plan so if you could see here um that fibula you know is is fractured um yeah. the talus is laterally translated and you also have a medial 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 malleolus fragment um, so this is an unstable ankle fracture. This is not one that needs to be stressed or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, when I see this, <clears throat> you know, as one of my partners says, what would the fifth grader do? And the fifth grader would try to get that, try to push that lateral malleolus, which uh, Nick's pointing out there, medially to uh, reduce that talus to back to its home. Yeah. So if the residents call you about this, what do you, I mean, I'm assuming that they're, they're managing this and they're calling you after they've reduced it and splinted it um, or if at all, but if they call you about it, what are you, what are you instructing them? Yeah. So like you just said, this needs to be reduced. I, I, this should not go out of the uh, ER without a reduction um, <clears throat> because this can cause a lot of, you know, this is a, not only a bony injury, but a soft tissue injury. Um, so, you know, I, I instruct them, they got to reduce it. If it can't be reduced, this gets admitted and fixed the next day. Yeah. And the spot that you worry about, you know, worry about a lot of things, but, you know, it's on the medial side here. Um, if it gets left like that, because that, as you might imagine, is putting a lot of tension on that, on that medial skin. So that's the spot we kind of worry about. Um, and sometimes if you may see these come into the OR and you'll notice that there's some fracture blisters, especially if it's, you know, real high en energy. Um, and that's, it seems like a lot of times they're on that medial skin there. So that's a little bit of an area that can be threatened. You want to be aware of. Right. So Remember, tension is always bad. People don't like tension in their lives and neither does the skin <laughs> or soft tissues. So words to the wise. <laughs> um, and then what about the, the lateral view? Can you go to it? I didn't see. Uh... Um, there we go. Yeah. So once again, you can see, um, the lateral malleolus fracture, the, you know, the fracture of the distal fibula, it's a long spiral, it looks like. Um, you can't really see if there's any posterior male. It doesn't look like it's a large one here, but, the, you know, many times I, I do get a CT scan on these and these will show a small posterior male fracture as well. Uh, but otherwise, you just it just shows the fracture displacement, I think, on these two, yeah. on this view. Yeah, the things I mean you'd want to really look for is look at the talus and make sure it's concentrically reduced underneath underneath the tibia. Sometimes you can get fooled on the AP and mortis view and it looks pretty good. And then, and then you look at the lateral and the lateral is actually fairly posteriorly subluxed. Um, so you just want to make sure you double check that. And like you said, looking to see the posterior mollulus. Um, so that brings up that, I mean, you brought up a point already. Is this somebody you're wanting a CT scan on? Does that help you? Yeah, I'm very aggressive with CT scans. So the answer is yes. Um, I, I think, you know, a couple of reasons. One, you can differentiate the fra if there's going to be like a posterior malleolus fracture, which I'm more aggressive fixing. <laughs> but also, if there's any, I don't always scope my ankles. 
I do scope some of them. And if, uh, if especially, you know, it gives me an idea if there's loose bodies and so forth within the joint as well. Yeah. Yeah. So she, and then um, if they get this splinted, just like to have some idea, if they get splinted and they, this would be one you're comfortable sending out as opposed to fixing it right away. I prefer to fix them right away. Um, I think you just, it's easier for the, I think it's easier for us. I don't know if it's easier for the patient, um, but the reduction, you know, when you go in there at 24 hours is much easier to do than waiting a week or two. What do you think that, that, you? Time, that time frame is, you know, just for, you know, some of those who have been in the OR and were like, you know, they're, you're starting to see some callus formation. Cause I'm sure everybody on the call or a lot of people on the call have been in cases, which it's relatively early on within 24 hours. And it seems like it's a lot easier. And then at what point does it become a lot harder? Is it, is it more than a week? Is it two weeks? Yeah. As long as it's reduced well in a splint, I think up to two weeks, you know, one to two weeks does not make a difference. After two weeks, it, you start to see a lot more healing. Yeah. Uh, but that's assuming it was reduced. Right. Um, and, and at least fair in the ballpark, but what about you? Are you, are you uh, admit and fix early? Or are you? Oh, no, I'm early? trying to do these as outpatients <laughs> as much yeah, as so, possible. But so I mean, I you know, I'm, it... I'm happy to get them done sooner as long as the swelling allows. It's definitely, like you said, it's definitely easier. But as soon as they get, you know, close to that two week mark, it gets a lot more tricky. Um, or not tricky, but just it's a lot harder. They don't come together quite as easily if you did as if you did this one the day after. Yeah, and I, th I think it also depends on the resources uh, of an institution or where you're you're set up. Like for us, yeah, uh, many times we're admitting these because we have we have the trauma room the next day, uh, where you know I may not know when I'm going to have elective time, you know, in an outpatient center to do this. Yeah, yeah. All there, right. There's so, a couple of questions okay. uh, here. Uh, at what point? Uh, in uh, intensity or injury are you letting it to sit it to sit to respect soft tissues or is it only high energy um so what about you nick when are you waiting to fix ankle fractures and when are you fixing them acutely um yeah i don't have a, a specific time i like to see them in clinic and then and then as long as they look you know not excessively swollen they have some wrinkles and what i mean by that is when you look at the skin it's not super tense and you can kind of you kind of start as the swelling starts to go down, you start to see some wrinkles present on the skin. Um, if there's blisters, then I will wait longer. Um, try to, you know, unless the blisters are away from uh, my approach. But you know, generally speaking, if there's if there's blisters, then I'm going to wait until those are largely resolved. So it's not a specific time uh, that I'm waiting, but you know that, that those are the clinical signs I'm looking for. How about you? Yeah. So I, I'm. I'm, I'm I'm very aggressive fixing them early. Um, and so I think if you fix them usually within 24 hours, you don't have those issues of blisters because it's just, it's too soon. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, that also is a, if it's a very high energy injury, I, I do occasionally will X fix them if they're dislocated and I can't split them and they need like soft tissue care, right? If they have blisters that need to be addressed and we can't hold them reduced in a splint. I have no problem X fixing some of these and staging them uh, at a later date. Um, so, you, you know, you got to respect the soft tissue. Like I said, this is a bony and a soft tissue injury. Yeah, so, that's right. um, you, you know, I, I always talk about patients when I see them pre-op that, Hey, if this is, <clears throat> if your soft tissues are bad, you have blisters, et cetera. Um, I'm going to put an X fix or a cage around your leg uh, for a week or two. Um, so I kind of tell them beforehand, because I don't take down the splint because, you know, if they were dislocated, I don't see the reason to try to, you know, uh, make them uh, dislocate again in the pre-op area. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's move on to the next slide here, maybe. All right. So we did get a CT scan in this case. I think she got it before she left the ER. Um, I don't have the whole cuts, but I, I kind of wanted to kind of uh, pare down to what I think I'm, you know, I'm mostly looking for, which is um, a posterior malleolar fracture. Um, here, you kind of look at the sagittal, which is that, that top left corner, that, or the, the image on the left, and then the axial, which is the image on the right. And, and those are kind of my go-tos. I don't know. I, maybe there's more that I should have included. Well, how about you, Jan? 
Yeah, I love looking at that axial image as well as the sagittal, because if you look at that axial image, you can see that the AITFL, so probably the anterior syndesmosis is intact, right? That just looks like where it should be. And so that makes me more confident when I reduce that lateral malleolus. And I did, you know, that the syndesmosis is going to be already reduced uh, because part of it's already in its home. Yeah. And, and there was a question here that I got uh, with posterior malfractures. Are you fixing more due to PT, uh, 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 PITFL and, uh, and syndesmotic complications? And I think I'm fixing more because I think, it, 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 you know, when in an unstable ankle fracture, you want to, you know, reduce the areas of instability. And it's going to help you um, hopefully reduce your syndesmosis that way in a more anatomic fashion. Um, how about you, uh, Nick? Are you fixing more? Are you, or, and and if so, why or why not? More, more. You said more of the posterior malleolar yeah. fractures. Yeah, uh, definitely have trended towards fixing more of them, and even in smaller in smaller cases. Um, and again, uh, you know, largely due to providing some stability to uh, syndesmosis. Now, I have a. I, I guess I feel I'm probably fairly aggressive with fixing the syndesmosis, even if if it's a subtle um, instability. Um, and so, you know, if there's a posterior malleolar fracture that I fix, even if it's fairly small, I have a fairly low threshold to, you know, back up the, um, the, the, the fixation and add syndesmotic fixation. And, you know, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but um, I'd rather do that and err on the side of uh, more stability as opposed to just fixing the posterior mass. So, and I would ask you, Nick, I'll ask you, <clears throat> have you ever regretted putting a syndesmotic screw or like flexible uh, fixation in? No. Have you ever regretted not putting it in? Yes. Okay. Yeah, me too. I I, <laughs> I think as long as you don't malreduce it with your fixation, right? Yeah, I mean, not, that's right. But assuming it's reduced, I, I've never looked back and like, oh man, wish I wouldn't have put that screw in. It's like, whatever, you just let them wait there and let the screw break. Yeah, so. that's that's exactly how how I've tended to look at it. Now, I'm not saying I don't want to say that I'm fixing every ankle fracture with syndesmotic fixation, but but to your point, if if there's somebody that that comes in and and I'm questioning it or I'm seeing subtle instability, I have a pretty low threat. All right, so, so what you do here? Well, I'm trying to advance my slides. I don't know why there's such a lag. Maybe it's this. Um... <clears throat> so this is, um, so we took her to the OR, obviously. And, um, you know, this is kind of how, this is how my setup looks. Uh, in the OR, I'm fairly, a, I'm an aggressive bumper. I put a fairly big bump underneath the, the hip, even if I'm doing, you know, kind of a routine uh, ankle fracture, because it tends to want to really externally rotate. So this is kind of what it looks like for me. I use that bone foam ramp. I don't know if you're using that, Jan, or not, or if you have blankets or, or what your go-to is. But this is kind of, I just wanted to show kind of what the setup's going to look like when you take somebody to the OR. So everything kind of draped out and then a, a pretty aggressive bump. And uh, that way, this allows me both medial and lateral exposure. Do you do anything different? No, I'm the same way. I, I, I'm, you know, bone foam. It allows for great for imaging. <clears throat> I think just for the lateral view, uh, the other leg does not get in the way. Uh, the other thing what I'll do too, before the setup, if I'm concerned regarding the syndesmosis, I will get contralateral uh, fluoroscopic views um, AP lateral and a mortis just to see, you know, just to have them to compare to my injured side later on. Do you do that on every case? I, I should, uh, but I don't, I do it when I know the syndesmosis is out or if I have a very high suspicion. Yeah. Yeah. Now are you using a large C arm or using, or, you know, standard C arm or using the little mini <clears throat> C arm? A large. I don't know how to use the mini one. <laughs> yes. It gets in the way. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It, I, you know, I've done them before with the small, but um, 
it's really hard for me to get a big enough field of view, I think, with that. And even just to get good good x-rays um, when I'm doing ankle cases. So I, I greatly prefer the large or the standard C-arm. All right, um, let's see here, just a click through here. Yes, there's a question here about the screw and the tightrope. We'll get that, we'll get through that here in a little bit. So how are you, so what's your approach? Are you, I, I use the kind of a, I don't know, basically a posterior lateral, not, you know, kind of off the back of the fibula. Um, and then I'm going, you know, down through soft tissue, um, try to dissect more proximal with the scissors, just because there's a potential that that superficial perineal nerves in the way. Um, and then once I get through that, then I'm usually kind of evacuating the hematoma and, and getting exposure. Now, this is a different, this is a different ankle, but these, I wanted to kind of show the clamps that I like using. Um, sometimes I'll refer to those who've worked with me, I'll call these the perfect reduction clamps because I think they're, um, they're great. I like having two of them because uh, sometimes you need to, you know, adjust one to, you know, reclamp with the other. What are you using, Jan? Yeah, so in terms of approach, <clears throat> you know, I would usually do a direct lateral if I'm going to do it supine. And I find the nerve proximally and then mostly distal to that, I will go almost knife to bone. Mm -hmm. um, because once I find the nerve, I know I'm safe. So I think a lot of people, you know, when I teach a lot of residents, they're looking for the nerve distally, and then they're really doing a lot of sub Q dissection, trying to find it where I find it more proximally. And I think it's just, it's easier to find there. And then distally, I'm not worried about it. And yeah. so that's, that's usually what I'll do. And then like you with these clamps, <clears throat> it depends, you know, these clamps can be very powerful or not powerful enough. I, I like the small lobster claws too. Um, you know, especially if, as you can see, that's the second clamp from the left. Um, I think that's very helpful to have that out on the back table and ready to go. Um, you know, have all your clamps kind of, you know, in a row. And then you can see on the far right, you have the speed lock Weber and just a le regular Weber clamp. I'll use that sometimes for like a syndesmosis or a posterior malfragment if I'm going supine. Uh, but these are clamps that I, I love having. They're just out. And, you know, the, the folks that I work with, I'm, I'm lucky enough and spoiled enough that they'll have these ready. Like they know what I'm going to use. And they, these are all laid out and they know I'm going to like ask it. And I'll do like point to point Weber. like. Um, so, but yeah, these are all great clamps to have in your, on your back table. Yeah. What do you, um, okay. So in a case like this, what do you want set wise? Like, what are you wanting on the back table? What are you wanting like open, ready to go? And then what do you want? Do you have anything that you want not open, but kind of ready to be able to open if you needed it? Yeah. So, you know, small frag is always going to be open. Um, and then many times I know going into a case, or at least have a very high suspicion, suspicion, and I'll know this, um, that I'll have a mini frag ready to go. Just a uh, standard mini frag. Yeah. I, I mean, yes. I mean, it has like two, four, two, seven plates and some two O plates. Okay. And then if you go to lag this, like, you know, like a lot of times we'll do, what are you going to use? What are you using for leg screws? Are you using three fives? Are you using two seven, two four, two zero? Oh? Yeah, I'm, I'm using either for bigger bones or bigger fibulas. I'll use three fives, but usually I'm using two sevens. I, I feel like they, you know, the three fives sometimes can um, unfortunately break the bone. It's it's similar to, you know, in the AO courses. I don't know if they still do this. I've not done an AO basic in a while, um, but like on the forearm, like if you think about an ulna and radius. You try not to lag with a three five because you can actually break the the bone, and I think the fibula is similar. Similarly, you can actually cut through it. It's just it's almost it's too far, too powerful, too big of a footprint. So I tend to lag with smaller screws. Yeah, like the head is too big. You know, yes. it's like the lead doesn't the head doesn't want to sit down nicely, and so it creates this this point that wants to to fracture. And especially if you get up higher, like when you get these fractures that go up higher. That's when I think even more like a 2-0 is actually a lot better. I agree with you. I use pretty much exclusively 2-7, sometimes 2-4, uh, but 2-7 seems to be kind of a happy medium uh, for leg screws. All right. Um, and yeah, the 2-7 the is nice because if you, if you strip it, 
and it, you know as you're putting putting it in or if you have your resident doing it and uh then you can bail out to a three five if you need to so you have a, at least a backup option yeah and that's what bethany just mentioned that in the chat uh, as well i totally agree with that you always have an option especially an older bone in the osteoporotic bone you always want to have some bail out so that that's it's always that's a great point yeah for sure I don't know who uses 3-0 screws. <laughs> I think that's, I think that might be arthrex. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, so on this case, I did, <laughs> I did uh, two, uh, two seven uh, screws here for my leg screws. And then I used a one, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, the seven, the, the, the number of completion, the seven, seven hole plate. And, you know, kind of put that, Really didn't contour it too much, if I remember right. On this case, didn't bend it, didn't need to bend it too much, and then uh, put it just proximal, kind of as a buttress plate. Um, in this in this case, um, and then went ahead and uh, placed uh, the more proximal fixation, as you can see here. And then I went ahead and filled distal. Um, what about what about a locking plate in this in this case? Are you using? I think I you know I'll use some locking screws distally because that bone gets a little wispy. Um, what how what are you are you fully small frag non locking screws for a case like this or? No, I'll use locking, uh, but I'll use uh, not necessarily the contoured locking distal fibular plates very often. I find that they sometimes are not great for, um, you know, in, in terms of soft tissue irritation distally. So I'll use like a one third tubular, um, but I can use like a locking one third tubular um, with sometimes dist distal locking screws. And then if I'm worried about the fixation, then I'll put a 90 90 plate. So I'll, I'll use an orthogonal plate with a mini, you know, something from the mini frag set, like a two four two seven just to lock in the distal fragment. Yeah, the um, so that's that was the question I had was when are you going to 9090 plating, you know, on these on these cases? Yeah, I'll go I'll go to it when I'm worried about the distal fixation or an osteoporotic bone. I, I'm very quick to go to 9090 plating. And where do you put your where do you put the plate in a dorse um, anterior? No, I, I put the plate posterior lateral. So I have like an anti-glide plate. And then I put a direct lateral plate. Okay. Okay. And then, um, and you'll do that as opposed to doing an anatomic pre-contoured plate. Yes. Before you would do that. Um, Correct. Yeah. Bethany brought up a good point that the, the some of those val those pre-contoured plates will pull you into a little bit of valgus too, um, almost to the point where if you're going to use it, I've sometimes bent it a little bit to take that out. Yeah, and the and the and the question about periosteal stripping, I, I'm not worried that worried about it. You don't see too many fibular non-unions, thankfully. Maybe we just get away with it. Um, but even if you, you know, when I you, when I place a two four two seven posterior plate, um, just like a you know posterior anti glide plate, I've not had uh, issues that I've noticed with. Um, with non-unions and, and, and they, they've looked at this, even there was an OTA abstract this year, looking at 90, 90 plating with mini frag plates. And, and they noticed no increased rate of failure when compared to uh, a anatomic locking plate. So equivalency. Um, but I, I just think you could, I think it's just easier to do. Then the anatomic plate. Yeah. Because I think the anatomic plate doesn't fit always. Just like you said, you, yeah. you said it, and so I don't have to contour it. I can, it's yeah. much easier to contour a, a, you know, two, four plate than an anatomic plate. And then, you know, worry about it. If it's not fitting right, am I doing something wrong uh, and so forth? Okay. Well, good points. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, here now, as we go to the medial side, one question about the medial side, are you, when do you do your medial exposure? Do you do that? right out the gate, do you expose both of them? Do you do one and then come back and do the other? Yeah, so if there's if there's uh, fragments within the joint, I'll usually expose it at the same time. Okay. Because I wanna wash out the joint thoroughly yeah. because you know when you have the lateral male that's not fixed, 
and that you could basically dislocate the ankle again and yeah. you know wash it all out get all the uh, you know cartilage fragments out of the joint uh, but otherwise else you know i'll do lateral first then medial i don't think it matters though yeah yeah and try to do the same thing as well where I, you know if i'm exposing them get them both exposed um and flush out the um flush out the joint and and then make sure that's that's looking good yeah uh, so, so here there's a question too that i got sent so this medial male fracture so what are you looking to to set for your medial male like what what's your common uh fixation construct here nick um you mean in terms of like what what landmarks am i looking for no i mean like your fixation like what 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 do you need like you, you i saw you at a little um dental pick that you brought up onto the screen yeah and so in terms so of the reduction you use you know what else are you using to reduce it and then once you reduce it how do you fix your medial male yeah so um i i like the dental pick a lot for these uh, for these parts of the fracture um because it you know i can kind of fine tune the reduction sometimes i'll put a couple of k wires into the fragment and then use the dental pick to refine uh, the reduction. I've used, you know, you can use a clamp. You can make a little drill hole or a pilot hole on the on the the tibia, and then get that around the corner. They also make kind of these pre-made, uh, like a like a one one tine is a straight, and the other one has a little bit of a curve, and it's it's kind of nice for the medial mal. It doesn't always work out quite as nice. Um, as you know see in the picture here but these are some clamps that you can that you can sometimes see that may help you know for for these fractures so that's those are the kind of things i do at the end of the day the most common thing i end up using is really a dental pick um, and then i'll usually provisionally fix these with a couple of 6-2k wires and then um and then go ahead and place my screws Jan, are you are you using a plate on the medial male like a hook plate or something not very often. I I am not a huge fan of hook plates. Um, and, and so if I have to plate something, like in this case, like let's say this is, you know, fairly standard medial mal, and it's either comminuted or it's something that I want some additional fixation, then I would use a tension band plate, I think is my is my go-to. But it never quite sits as flush as I would like it to. Um, when I do that, it always sits, lifts off the bone a little bit. So, and that can be uh, symptomatic in that area. How about you, Jan? Yeah, I, I rarely will use a hook plate. Um, you know, I use a, like a medial male plate or something, a plate medially, if it's more of a SAD like injury, yes. a, you know, yeah. supination adduction. Can you but just, so just before you move on, I just am going to highlight this here, hopefully. Um, you know, if you're doing that, what he means is, is that's this fracture that goes more vertical. That's where a plate yeah. is more helpful. Um, but when it's more of a horizontal fracture or kind of an oblique fracture where you can put the screws almost perpendicular to the fracture line, then I think screws are probably the way to go as opposed to a plate. All right, go ahead, Jan. Yeah, so that's exactly so. Uh, you know, I will seldomly um, use a plate. At, you know, I think a hook plate can work sometimes. Um, it just, it, it's going to be, uh, more soft tissue, you know, more prominent immediately. And I, I, you know, there's, there's occasional, I think, indications for a hook plate immediately. Um, but it's not my go-to and that's mostly because of the soft tissue irritation that I find uh, yeah. that the patients have. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. And, and the same thing with the tension band. I think uh, I, I got a question here regarding tension band. And, you know, I've tension band the medial side as well, just like you do like for an olecranon osteotomy. And, and but um, I'll, I'll tend to tension it with, are you using wire or using like fiber wire? No, I, well, I guess what I was referring to is a tension band plate where, oh, okay. you know, like out of the, like a mini frag plate that's super flexible, but you put, you know, maybe two, two screws into the medial mouth leg them but with the plate and then you kind of you know bend that bend that plate up alongside um with a couple screws kind of going you know a little more proximal to really kind of suck suck that up so basically um, you're making your own hook plate basically making your own hook plate yeah but the you know the nice thing about doing it with those little mini frag plates is there's a lot 
it's a lot less prominent than a lot of the hook baits um, that are out there. Um, so in this case, well, maybe. So we did uh, two medial mouth screws. I just used, I think these were three, five screws. You can see my, you know, my angle on that lateral view is a little bit uh, anterior to posterior, which I don't, I don't really mind. You know, if you look at where that sits, that fracture sits a little bit oblique in that, in that plane anyway. So, you know, that was a little bit more of a oblique angle. And so they're directing posterior. I had to switch out one of my screws because it went out the back. It was a little bit long, um, as you can see, you know, in this case, if you, if you really get critical. Um, and then, you know, this is my, this is my cotton test. And, and this is maybe where I struggle a little bit is discerning, you know, instability. So what's your cotton test? What are you doing right where, there? What I do is I put my hand on the proximal tibia. I put a clamp on the, um, a clamp onto the uh, fibula. And then I will pull it, externally rotate it, try to move that fibula laterally, trying to demonstrate any widening um, across the syndesmosis. Um, and I want to look to see if there's, and then I'll do an extra rotation stress uh, exam, which, you know, I don't really have on this uh, saved, but um, where there's, you know, see if there's any widening on the medial, medial clear space or widening between the syndesmosis. And, you know, the thing that's interesting, and, and I'd get, be interested to get your thoughts on it, is that, you know, sometimes I, I'll do it and I'm like, yeah, it looks pretty good, doesn't look too bad. And, you know, in this case, I didn't think it looked too bad. And then I'll kind of look at it directly and I'll push it posterior, anterior, externally rotate it and look for like sagittal instability or extra rotation instability. And all of a sudden you just, you start to like, you can just visibly see the thing moving around. And so I probably have a pretty low threshold in that case to proceed with syndesmotic fixation in that, in that, in this case. What about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I, 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 you know, I'll do an external rotation test and a cotton test. Um, and then I also just look, you know, for sagittal instability. And that, that's why I like to get the um, preoperative, you know, or intraoperative fluoresc uh, flu uh, fluoro views of the contralateral side, because I want to see where that fibula, where that fibula is sitting on the lateral view. And I think that's key in reducing the syndesmosis correctly. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, the lateral seems to be a, a more important uh, predictor. Hey, uh, before I get too far, let's talk about medial mouth screws because there's a couple questions about annulated versus solid screws. What what are your th what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, I, you know, I, I use solid screws. I don't think it matters. Um, I you know what everybody you know people can use whatever they're comfortable with. I think. Um, so I mean, if if you're looking right at the medial mouth, I think it's just as easy to put a you know, when you're using a drill bit and you're using like a three, five screw, the two, six drill bit is a lot easier to control as opposed to a very flimsy cannulated wire. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I prefer solid. I think it's just, I think it's easier and more reproducible for me at least. Yeah. I, I really like the solid screws on the medium, I, I, on the medial mount. Again, I don't think it's, I don't think it matters that much, um, uh, you know, clinically from, from one to the next. So I think that, um, you know, I think either one's an, an option, but, you know, one thing I do like about these is I can get a little smaller when that piece gets a little bit smaller than I, I can go to a two, seven, or sometimes even yeah. a two, four, uh, screw. So that, that part is actually really, um, the, uh, okay. So, and then there was another question here, indications where you'd fix the medial, medial malleolus first, and then do the, do the fibula, any indications for you? John? Um, I think if it's open, I go for the medial side first. Um, or if I think something's trapped in it, like I said, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's there, but, um, you, you know, like I said, if I, if I think there's multiple loose fragments within the joint and I open medially and I can see the reduction, I think it's fine to fix medially first. There's no harm in it. I know some surgeons and some very, very well-known trauma surgeons. That's, that is their preferred approach. They go medial first, then they, uh, to clean out the joint. And then they, since they're there, they fix the medial side and then they go lateral. Yeah. And then, so, 
Yeah, if it's like a comminuted fibula and I got a good read on the medial mal, then I'll go medial first. That's probably the most of the time when I'll when I'll do that um, as well. It, it just seems like it it helps make sure that I got that that if I know I can get that part better than the than what the fibula is going to look like. Yeah, the other thing that's really key in terms of um, so you got to use the clues that are given to you during a case. So for example, if if you know if you can get your fibula well reduced. Okay, and you know it's like a simple fracture pattern and you get it perfectly reduced, your medial male will usually line up. And so I think it can help you sometimes like, you know, judge your, uh, your reduction on the lateral side um, because of the ligamentous taxis. So if you notice something, if, 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 some, if a person thinks their lateral male is perfect, but their medial male is way off, they should probably reassess their medial male. I mean, I mean their lateral male uh, reduction. Yeah. So in this case, you know, I, I did see some more um, instability just clinically. And I didn't see so much on the on the uh, X-rays, but you know, as I was looking at it, I was concerned enough that I went ahead with um, fixing the syndesmosis. And I I use a lot of um, flexible fixation tight rope, you know, device. Um, I will use screws as well. There was a question that popped up about you know one versus the other. I, for me, most of the time, if I'm using a screws, it's because it's somebody with maybe not very good bone, and I'm I'm increasing the stability of my construct because I don't know if I necessarily trust them. That's probably the most common scenario. I, I had another scenario that came up where um, it. it um, it was a scenario in which they actually had a medial, like some tenting on the medial skin, some threatened skin medially, and I didn't want to put a button underneath it. So then I went and used screws in that scenario as well. Um, so it's, how about you, Jan, uh, one versus the other? So, so I go back and forth um, on older patients where I'm worried about bone quality. Um, and I, I want to use the Synesmotic screws as added fixation. <clears throat> so if they're, you know, osteoporotic, um, then, you know, I use screws on younger patients where I'm not as worried about bone quality. I tend to use more flexible fixation. Now. Um, I, I just think it makes sense that a joint that, um, is supposed to move that you allow it to move and not put something rigid across it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I definitely think I have been guilty of malreducing a uh, syndesmosis by putting my fixation across it. Uh, no question. <laughs> I think all of us have, right? All the studies show where we are horrible at fixing the syndesmosis. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then are you opening your syndesmosis to look directly at it and fix <clears> it? <throat> yes. If I am supine, I will open it and directly look at it. And then do you do an anterolateral look? Is that what you do? Make an anterolateral incision or you extend your lateral incision? No, I, I'll do an, a separate, you, a lot of times I'll do a separate anterior lateral incision, uh, like the way uh, Tornetta describes it. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, but if I'm prone, I can't do that. Yeah. So, okay, so if you're doing it. that, what are you looking for when you, when you say you're opening it to look at it? What? Um... You're looking at the cartilage in that, um, I can't take care. Can you oh, go here? here? I'll show you here. Yeah. So, yeah. You right want to here. make sure the cartilage lines up in that area where he's uh, on the lateral or the medial part of the fibula, as well as the lateral part of the plafond. Yeah. And it just kind of all, it looks like it's congruent, almost like Shenton's line of the hip. Sometimes I've heard him refer to it as a Mercedes sign or something like that, where all those lines, all those areas come together. And if you do an anterolateral little, you know, arthrotomy, you can still look you know, right at it. Um, there's a question is fixing the syndesmosis <laughs> if you're having to fix the ankle from a posterior or prone position approach. Jan, um, I think we've talked about this before, but um, just, you know, 30 second highlight on that. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear. If, I you're fix it, if you have to fix the syndesmosis and you're prone. Yeah, I don't like doing it, but I did it today. Um, <laughs> so, I do the same things. I compare the lateral views um, of each side and then. Um, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I, I will, you know, I'll do it the same way I do it, would do it supine, but I can't look at it directly, unfortunately. So I, it's all by x-ray, um, all by x-ray views. Yeah. 
So I, when I do my flexible fixation, I tend to use the, you know, the, the system I have, it, it has a cannulated technique or a solid drill technique. I actually like the cannulated technique because um, I like to put the wire and then check it. Um, I've had some that end up either too posterior or too anterior. Um, and so I'll put the wire in and I'll get it all the way to the far cortex. And then I'll get a good lateral just to make sure I know about where it's exiting. Uh, maybe that's over over engineering it, but um, I've liked the way, you know, then I at least have some confidence that I know where that button's going to sit on the medial side. Um, and I'll I'll do the same thing or a similar thing where I'll I'll look at it. I don't always make the anterolateral arthrotomy. Sometimes I can get that lateral incision and kind of retract up the front and look at the um, look at that space. I feel like I can see it pretty well. I know there's maybe steps, maybe against literature a little bit, but and it depends a little bit on how bad that syndesmosis looks. Um, this is a good question here by Roth. You know, for a Mason new fracture, consider using hybrid fixation and flex uh, hybrid fixation with rigid and flexible for the syndesmosis. Why and if you would, which one would you put in first, the screw or the flexible fixation? So Jan, so you have a Mason new. You're not fixing the fibula. Uh, there's some argument that you should use a, some hybrid fixation because a screw gives you some more rigid stability, so you you know you're not length unstable, um, and then also use a uh, flexible fixation you know as a in addition to that, so some hybrid fixation in that case. If you're doing that, what that's a good question. That's something I've thought about before. Which um, which one are you putting in first to fix it? Yeah, so if I do hybrid fixation, I will put a screw first. And then the flexible fixation, because um, I think you want something rigid first to like maintain your length, and then you're backing it. For me, then I look at it as like backing it up with the flexible fixation. How about you? Well, I've I've gone back and forth. I guess you know what I'll what I've tended to do is I'll make that anterolateral incision in that case, and then you know look at the directly at the syndesmosis, make sure it's reduced pin it. And then, you know, I, I think I would put the flexible in first because, you know, there's some thought that as you secure that down, it kind of lets that find its home a little bit yeah. um, and then fix it with the screw. But I don't, I don't know if I, if that's right or wrong. Like, I don't know yeah. if anybody's seen anything. Yeah. So it's funny that you say that because the last time I did that by accident and I usually do screw first, then, then, you know, flexible. And I did the opposite and I was like, oh, it's not going to matter. And what happened was, so I put the flexible and I got it really tight. I thought really tight. And then I cut the suture mm. and I put the screw in and I got it a little bit more compressed. So you think it was this, I mean, if you, yeah. So then I guess the point is either if you're going to do the tightrope first or the flexible first, then don't uh, cut the suture. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I could have done that too. Uh, yeah, be curious to know, Jan put a question in there. Who's, you know, what, uh, are they seeing people use more screws or flexible fixation uh, when you're in, you're in the different OR? So this, uh, that, um, this is kind of what we ended up with. You know, I don't have, you know, final three month follow up weight bearing x rays, but overall I was pretty pleased with the way it came together. Um, and uh, it seems, you know, seems to be doing fine, but 